Hey guys, welcome back. We are going to enter a brand new area and that is endocrinology. It's a very interesting area, provided if you understand things properly. And that's why I need to start with a kind of introductory chapter to endocrinology where we will be discussing about the hormones, receptors and the mechanism of actions. And of course, we need to uh, discuss about pituitary a little bit as well. And this is a very important topic, don't miss it. And first, let us talk about the hormones and their action. When you talk about hormones, hormones are substances that are secreted at one place and are carried predominantly by blood to a different place where it's going to exert its action. And there are different classification systems for hormones. But I feel this is the most genuine classification system where you can divide the hormones into group 1 lipophilic hormones and group 2 hydrophilic hormones. What are the hormones that come under group 1 lipophilic, which means they are lipid soluble? Number 1, steroid hormones. It could be adrenal steroids or it could be gonadal steroids. The best example for that will be cortisol, aldosterone, testosterone, estrogen and so on. And second one is going to be thyroid hormones. Remember most of the amine based hormones or amino acid based hormones are going to be hydrophilic. The only exception for the tool is going to be thyroid hormones which contain a lot of tyrosine. Vitamin D, if you consider it as a hormone, then you can consider it as a lipophilic hormone. Otherwise, no. Remember, the half-life of these hormones are going to be long, like in the order of hours to days. And that is because they have transport proteins. And they should have transport proteins because they are lipophilic. They are not water-soluble. Rather, they are lipid-soluble. So to carry them in the blood, definitely you need transport proteins. And that's going to definitely increase the half-life. For example, look at cortisol. You have cortisol binding globulin, that's a transport protein. And look at your testosterone or estrogen, you have sex hormone binding globulin. Look at thyroid hormones, you have thyroid binding globulin. You do have transport proteins and even albumin carry a variety of steroid hormones. And because they are lipophilic, they are going to easily cross the cell membrane. And that's why the receptors are going to be intracellular. It could be intracellular, intracytoplasmic or it could be intracellular, intranuclear receptors as well. Signal transduction is going to happen via a receptor hormone complex. I'll show you the image in a while. Where that is going to act on a particular domain in the nucleus, thereby increasing or decreasing the transcription of the target gene. And degradation is going to be by inactivation and conjugation especially in the liver. We know most of steroids are inactivated by conjugation. And what about the group 2 hormones? These are hydrophilic, water-soluble hormones. And most of them will be amine-based hormones. The only exception for this rule is going to be T3, T4, that is triiodothyronine and thyroxine. And many peptide and protein-based hormones like parathyroid hormone, insulin, glucagon, all these are basically hydrophilic hormones. And what is the duration of action? They're going to act only for a short period of time. Most of the times your half-life is going to be in the order of minutes or even seconds. And because they are water soluble, they don't need any transport proteins and probably that is the one reason why the duration of action is quite short. And because they cannot cross the cell membrane, they're going to act on the plasma membrane, which means the receptors will be located in the plasma membrane. And the signal transduction is going to happen through certain second messengers. Like cyclic AMP, we'll discuss that in detail. And the metabolism of these hormones are going to happen via enzymatic degradation or proteolysis. If it's amine-based hormones, predominantly it's going to be enzymatic degradation. So protein or peptide-based hormones, it's going to be by proteolysis. For example, look at catecholamines. They are metabolized by monomine oxidase and COMT, that is catechol o methyl transferase. So that's something but enzymatic degradation. And look at how your steroid hormones work or in general lipophilic hormones work. You have the hormone that is lipid soluble is going to go across the cell membrane. We are going to have an intracellular intracytoplasmic receptor when it comes to your steroid hormones. And they are going to form something called as hormone receptor complex. And this is going to migrate to the nucleus. In the nucleus, you have a special region called as hormone responsive element or HRE where the hormone receptor complex is going to bind 
and that is going to increase or probably even decrease the transcription of target gene. So in case if you are increasing the transcription of a target gene, that mRNA will be transcribed and that's going to come out of the nucleus where in the cytoplasm in the ribosomes, you're going to translate that into a protein and thereby you can cause genetic expression. This is how your lipophilic hormones are going to work. And we know that your hydrophilic hormones, the group 2 hormones are going to work via cell surface receptors. And what are the different types of cell surface receptors that we have? We have GPCRs. What are GPCRs? These are G protein coupled receptors. And we have three types of GPCRs GQ type, GS type, and GI type. And we have receptor tyrosine kinases that's always called as RTKs. And we have non receptor tyrosine kinases which are called as NRTKs. And we have receptor serine threonine kinases that are called as RSTKs. And it's important to understand that more than 70% of the hormones are going to act via the G protein coupled receptor pathway only. You know very well. So, what is GPCR? It's a receptor with seven transmembrane domains or seven membrane spanning domains. And on the outside, it's going to bind with a particular ligand that is a hormone on the inside of the cell. It's going to be coupled with a G protein, which could be of GQ type or GS type or GI type. What are the ligands? Multiple ligands. For that matter, I would say anything that's not a ligand for other types of receptors is going to be a ligand for GPCR. What are the substrates? For GQ type of GPCR, the substrate is phospholipase C, where the activity of phospholipase C will be increased if the GQ pathway is activated. On the other hand, for GS and GI pathway, adenine cyclase is going to be the most important substrate, which means in G stimulatory pathway, the adenine cyclase activity will be increased, whereas in G inhibitory pathway, the adenine cyclase activity will be decreased. And what are the second messengers? Once phospholipase C is activated, it's going to produce more of inostal triphosphate and diacylglycerol, and the level of IP3 and DAG will be increased. When it comes to G stimulatory or G inhibitory pathway, Cyclic AMP is the one that's going to be affected because of the involvement of adenylate cyclase. If it's G stimulatory pathway, the amount of cyclic AMP in the cell is going to increase. If it's G inhibitory pathway, then the amount of cyclic AMP in the cell is going to decrease. And what are the terminal proteins that are activated? What are the terminal pathway that's going to be responsible for the hormone expression? If it's GQ pathway that is activated, your protein kinase C will be affected and the activity of protein kinase C will be increased. If it's G stimulatory or G inhibitory, the protein kinase A is the one that will be affected. If it's G stimulatory, the activity of protein kinase A will be increased. If it's G inhibitory, the activity of protein kinase A will be reduced. And what about your RTKs? RTK is nothing but receptor tyrosine kinases. Mostly the growth factors are the ones that are going to work via the RTK pathway. We can say it's a growth factor pathway. One of the important growth factors we encounter in common day-to-day -day life is insulin. Apart from that, anything that has growth or growth factor in it, like epidermal growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, it's going to work via RTK. The only exception for that is TGF beta though. Transformation growth factor beta is going to work via RSTK pathway, not RTK pathway. And what is the substrate for this? Substrate is IRS, that is insulin receptor substrate. And there is no second messenger involved. We can understand that the second messenger is also going to be the IRS only. But the activity of IRS will be increased. And that's going to activate other secondary pathways. And terminal pathways like RAS MAP kinase pathway is also called as PA3K AKT pathway. And of course, it's going to increase the activity of protein kinase B as well. And what about NRTKs? NRTKs are non-receptor tyrosine kinases, which means after binding to the ligand, the receptors are going to dimerize. So they're not basically receptors in the first place. After binding to the ligand only, they're going to dimerize. And these are famously called as JAK stat receptors or simply JAK receptors, Janus kinases. So what are the ligands for the JAK stat pathway or the JAK receptors or the NRTK service called as non receptor tyrosine kinases. All are going to be the same. And we can remember by the mnemonic called as TINs, TERS, and 2Gs. So, what are the TINs? Talking about prolactin. 
erythropoietin, thrombopoietin. And what is the TUS? TUS nothing but interleukins, interferons. And what are the two Gs? Growth hormone and GMCSF. Okay, growth hormone and GMCSF. So these are the TINs, TERS and 2Gs that are going to act as ligands for the NRTK pathway or the jac stat pathway. So the receptors are basically called as JAK receptors, otherwise called as Janus kinases. But what will be the substrate? Substrates will be the stat proteins. We have plenty of different types of stat proteins and the discussion of those is beyond the scope of the current discussion. And these stat proteins are going to go into the nucleus. There's no any additional second messenger or terminal pathway here. The stat takes care of everything. It's going to translocate to the nucleus and the activated stat is going to bind to certain nuclear domains, thereby activating or inhibiting the transcription of a particular gene. So what about RSTKs? These are receptor serine threonine kinases. And the most important ligand for this will be the TGF beta, very important because it's a growth factor, but still, it's not going to bind with your receptor tyrosine kinases, rather it's going to work via the RSTK path. Another example is BMP, that is bone morphogenic protein, and we have antimullerian hormone. These are three important ligands that's going to work via the RSTK pathway. And the substrate will be SMAD, and once SMAD is activated, that itself is going to translate to the nucleus, so you don't need any additional second messenger or terminal pathway. It takes care of everything, and it's going to increase or decrease the transcription of a particular gene. And here is an example of certain cell surface receptors. In the first example, we have the receptor tyrosine kinases, where they're basically receptors in the first place with alpha and beta domains, and they are dimers to start with. And once the ligand binds, for example, insulin, it's going to activate the insulin receptor substrate, and that's going to activate downstream pathways like your protein kinase B pathway and MAP kinase and ERK pathway also called as PA3K AKT pathway and for that matters if it's insulin the signaling of the protein kinase B pathway is going to result in metabolic effects whereas signaling via the MAP kinase and the ERK pathway this PA3K AKT pathway is going to result in growth stimulation and increased genetic expression and here is an example of NRTK or is called as JAKSTAT pathway Basically, they are not dimers to start with, they are not receptors at all to start with. But once the ligand binds, they dimerize with each other. And there will be autophosphorylation of this Janus kinases. And once they are activated, they are going to phosphorylate these stat proteins. And it's going to further result in stat dimerization. And this is going to translocate to the nucleus, where it's going to act on certain nuclear domains specific for stat, and it's going to activate or inhibit the transcription of certain genes, thereby altering the genetic expression. This is the JAK-STAT pathway. 